Hey, Hytham, welcome to Brokers and Brews, my man. Hey, what's up, man? Good to be here. Before we get too into it, of course, we have to talk about what we brought. And I think each of us didn't bring a brew, but we definitely brought something special to uh, sip on during the conversation. So what what'd you bring for us uh, this evening? You know, I got to go with a classic, uh, went with Little Back Label, nice. Double Black, I believe it is. Uh, and, uh, you know, old time favorite of ours. Nice, nice. Well, I, um, I went with a little Tito's. And a newer, it's called Day Trip. It's a okay. CBD, no THC, CBD drink, 10, 10 milligrams of CBD. So, you know, uh, my inspiration for uh, video and podcast and all that stuff is Joe Rogan. He's always cracking a kill cliff. So I figured I might as well get after it myself with a local Day Trip CBD infused uh, drink. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's the hottest craze right now, CBD and, and that whole realm. So, I mean, I'm interested to see how that takes off in the next couple of years. Yeah, it's interesting, you know, they talk about all the various benefits. And the one thing I haven't been able to understand is like, if you, what, how are we taking some CBD through an ointment, through a drink, through a whatever? Um, does it do all the stuff it's supposed to do? Or is it only going after like one thing? Do you have to get different CBDs? You know, like, uh, is it like Tylenol versus aspirin? Or like, what's the deal here? <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, the problem is, is that it, like, like any kind of natural, I guess, I guess you can classify that as natural science is, is there's really no long-term studies. So does it actually do anything? Is it a placebo effect? You know what I mean? I guess if it, if it does what you want to do, whether it's a placebo effect or not, I mean, then I guess you should accomplish, right? Exactly. 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 All right. So cool. Well, we're not here to talk CBD, although we can. Cheers, my friend. And I wanted to really get a perspective your company is Bold Media Marketing, and you and I have never met, but through the power of Facebook, we have seen probably quite a bit of each other, and um, we have a lot of mutual uh, friends in the business, and I'm really curious, you know, we're here, it's um, kind of the beginning, I guess, I like to think either beginning or end of, uh, of a month, so we're at the beginning, um, going toward the middle of May, and, you know, we're still in the midst of various things going on um pandemic wise if that's the right word and um you know i'm really curious like your business first of all like what do you do you know how's it how was it you know established and things like that but eventually i really want to know like what are your clients talking about right now because you know i watch a lot of cnbc and um there seems to be a lot of mixed you know reviews there so just locally you know kind of how things are going but tell us about bold media and um what you do how you started how you got into it things like that Okay. Fantastic. Um, so Bold Media is a marketing firm. Uh, we began over a decade ago, coincidentally, through through the 2008 uh, meltdown, uh, the depression that happened there. So we're no stranger to kind of these tough economic uh, conditions. Uh, my background actually is in computer programming. I graduated from Eastern Michigan in 2008 with my bachelor's in computer science. So I'm a coder. Uh, I'm doing it for close to uh, 20 years. Um, and when the economy melted down in 2008, when I graduated, rather than taking a coding job, I ended up starting a, a development firm. Because at the time, it was kind of easy money. You know what I mean? You develop a website, you get this cash. I didn't have really overhead to worry about. And then through time, we sort of evolved, took on more services, um, grew uh, in, in company size, and et cetera. And for the past four or five years, we've really focused primarily on providing multi-channel marketing approaches for businesses, primarily in the Michigan area. Primarily in what? In the Michigan area. Oh, Michigan area. Okay. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I think I think to, to answer part of to, to part of your question, business has really evolved, and 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 business professionals really evolved over the past decade. Right? So. When the, the economy went down in 2008 and everybody was desperate for money, it was sort of this Walmart mentality, like I could say. One person does everything. And we were kind of there at one point. You know what I mean? Like, everybody took whatever money they could, whatever sales they could. Um, and and it slowly transformed over time as the economy got better, as, as businesses solidified, they became stronger. So... Once it got to about 2016, 2017, people realized, hey, listen, I'm not desperate for this money anymore. 
not that they're not using it. They're just not desperate to take whatever they can get. So then you get all of these people who are Hey, right, let me get back real quick. Hey, um, I'm going to pause this. Let's try and reestablish our connection because um, you're chopping, and I don't know if it's on my end or your end, but I'm only catching every other word. Oh, okay. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. All right, so let's do this. All right. So welcome back. I didn't know we'd have a commercial break. Um, but, you know, the thing, <laughs> one of the downsides, right, of uh, doing these things virtually is uh, sometimes our Wi-Fi messes up. We have to change locations. So here we are. So you said, you know, you basically said, uh, as a recap, 2008, graduate, kind of get into this. And basically 2016 um, is where we kind of left off. And and so kind of pick up from there as far as, like, uh, what's going on with business and, and really um, why people are changing maybe the way that they've done things or, or what have you, you know, kind of where you're at. Absolutely. So, so back going back to, to 2016, what we noticed was that many businesses really narrowed their field of vision. I guess that's a better way of saying it, where it wasn't a, a Walmart mentality or a Meyer mentality where they have every service in stock. But it was more so they were focusing on the services that they specialized in and that they made money in. So for a company like mine, for example, at one point we were doing too much, you know, I mean, that, that, that really some of our auxiliary services watered down, but we were able to then pull back and focus on what we were really good at. And that's the marketing aspect of it. So we saw a lot of that happening um, towards six, 2016, 2017 where companies were gaining their footing in the ground and they didn't really need everything. So you had many of these uh, companies specializing in items and, and building their strengths on that. So we focused on those companies. We worked with them to help build their presence and help them to gain this community or their brand recognition over the past four years until obviously everything happened in the past couple of months. And it's really pumped the brakes on many businesses. Sure. So, I mean, as far as, because I think you're right, um, even in the world of real estate, you know, which is my side of business, I feel like for a while it was, you know, do everything for everybody. And, and I think that was because, um, you know, things like Zillow and such really came on the scene where. Zillow could do everything for everybody. It could put you in touch with a, a, a mortgage person, but it could also put you in touch with, you know, a realtor, whether you're looking in a township, you know, 40 miles from your current, you know, city, and then maybe 40 miles the other way. And, you know, traditionally real estate agents didn't necessarily work that way. And, and then ultimately we see kind of a resurgence in the last few years of, really being the area expert, know your market, you know, whatever your market is. And so, you know, really understand everything there is to know when it comes to not just the businesses around, but how many days on market is the house in, in your market? How fast do they sell? What's the average price point? Are they often going to multiple offers? All that type of stuff, because that's the way to conduct business, right? It's like knowing your backyard, knowing your market. And, um, and so it's interesting that you kind of saw this a similar thing, you know, a different way, but the same thing really is that, you know, focus in on, on your area of expertise and mm -hmm. sure you might be able to do a little bit more. Um, you understand marketing, you understand computers. So, you know, you might be able to go a little bit out of your normal reach if, if there's the right need, but for the most part, go after what you really know and do what you do best, you know? hundred percent. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's, that's the benefit of a strong market, right? That's the benefit of a strong economy is that, you know, if everybody's doing well, then, then we, can, we can really focus in on what we want to. You know what I mean? We're not, we're not desperate because obviously for any business, it's kind of you want that power of choice, right? You don't want to be desperate for business. You right. want to have the freedom to take what business you want and then sort of push the rest off to the side or off to those who may be desperate, may be beginning, may be at a different level than you and I are, um, and, and who need that type of stuff. But ultimately, we want to be able to take what's going to make us happy in the long run. And, and sometimes, and, and thank you to the economy, I mean, really how we've been, we had that luxury. So it was, it was awesome for a very long time. 
And so you say you focused in, I mean, what is your focus points? What are the main, what's, if someone's looking for services, what are the services that they should be coming to you for? Well, so where we are, where we are as a business is we're not a number company. We don't work with just anybody. We don't, we don't want to work with just anybody. That's not really our thing. We work with the companies that come to us and that want to hit a multi-channel approach meaning they want to be on the web, they want to be on social media, they want to be in advertising, and they want to do it all at the same time. So somebody to help them not only facilitate that strategy, but maintain it and monitor it in a long-term uh, mentality. They don't want somebody who's just here for today, gone tomorrow type thing. Sure. And so <clears throat> do you help them establish a budget, for example, for like those those platforms right because your website depending on what you do you know your website could be very simple cost a couple hundred dollars and 30 bucks a year to maintain or it could be thousands of dollars just for the build out and thousands of dollars to maintain um and then with that there's like you said there's the advertising and the social um aspect of things um somebody that comes to you, are you able to help them figure out a budget for their business as far as, you know, not just what you can do, but really so they understand like, hey, if you don't do this, you're kind of wasting your time or you might be really kind of throwing money away because you're not going to gain all the benefits you're looking for. Absolutely. Well, every every meeting that we have, every meeting starts off with a one to one, like sort of like how you and I are discussing right now. We, we get to learn a little bit about each other. We, we talk about what their needs are. We talk about what their goals are um, and see if there is an opportunity for us to help them with it. Um, there's, been, there's been many times where coming out of that initial meeting, we would tell them, frankly, we're not the right company for us or you're not the right company for, for us, um, for them, excuse me. Um, so we have no problem. We have no problem having that discovery meeting where we go into, well, okay, what is your KPIs? Uh, what is your what is your return on investment for a sale? And how many sales is it going to take for you to get to where you need to be? And at what budget will you be at for that? So having that initial meeting helps us to discover that once we're able to set that baseline as far as, okay, you're going to need to make X amount of dollars, but it's going to cost you Y amount of dollars. What is the benefit for you? Is that going to be a net gain or a net loss? Yeah, so that's all happening in that discovery meeting. Uh, if you don't get a call from at least one realtor uh, after this, then like I'm not doing my job because I'll tell you, I mean, if we are a business that really understands or at least the agents that do a good, do a good business, they understand it's a numbers business. Everything's numbers um, yeah. from how many conversations to get a contract to, you know, how many contracts to get to a certain number of sales and what have you. And even a person like myself who is very people oriented, um, I'm not a person that's going to um, cold call 30, 30 people a day. I'm not going to do a certain, you know, outbound calls and things like that because it's just not how I operate. And there's nothing wrong with it. It's just not my business model. Um, I still have uh, an idea of what it, what it takes, right? The biggest thing for me is just that, because I talk to the same people that live in the same area that I might market to, it's hard for me to specifically say, well, this one postcard is the only thing that worked because odds are you probably saw me at, you know, the kids, well, when we were still doing sports, you might've seen me at the kids, you know, uh, football game or soccer game, or I might've sponsored something or, you know, so it's like, you might've seen that gotten the postcard. Plus we had 23 mutual friends and you reached out to me, you know, so it is a combination, but Real estate and every business is always numbers driven. It's always, like you said, how, how many of what to get to this dollar and is it worth it? Um, a previous, in my previous life, I had a moving company with a partner who he had a separate business and he grew that business through word of mouth and through Google ads. And I mean, I couldn't believe it because I obviously would Google um, whatever, you know, restaurant. I mean, this is like 2012. So Google was big but it wasn't exactly you know the the same monster it is today and growing and uh, you'd google you know local restaurant and you'd see some stuff but i never in my once in my life had ever clicked on an ad and i couldn't believe that it worked well sure enough we ran some google ads for our moving company and the phone started ringing 
you know? So um, it was always interesting to look at, okay, how much money do we have to spend to get a certain amount of moves? How much, how many of those moves, you know, for a bottom line and, and things like that. So for sure, um, that was a really, really important aspect of things and understanding it because I, I don't understand it when I come to you, right? I go, this is what I want, but I don't know how to get there. So for you to have that understanding is like key, <laughs> I guess it's really where I'm going with that. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, part of my job is to educate. And I know not many companies like to do that. Many companies, um, from my experience, have, have been more of a give us the money, let us do our thing, and hopefully it works, hopefully it doesn't work. But what we like to do and what really differentiates us is we, we spend a lot of time educating uh, our clients on what we're doing and why we're doing it. If we make a change, if we pivot from something, if we choose a particular strategy, we try to educate on why we're going that route so that the client can appreciate the amount of work and the effort that we're putting into um, the branding campaign, especially in, in Google advertisements. The thing, the thing with an advertising campaign is you have so many variables. I mean, if you're talking on a very basic level, you have your geo-targeting, you have your keywords, you have your ad copy, uh, and then you have your ad budget for your keywords and then your site links and et cetera. So, I mean, those are five completely different areas that can vastly affect your advertising performance uh, in different ways. So that's why when, when customers come to us and they come and they say, hey, we want to do advertising, uh, and then they want to make these radical changes in a short period of time, <laughs> our first thing is, hey, let us get some data on us and let's make one tweak at a time so that we can monitor and test what's working. It's kind of like a patient in a hospital. You know, if you make all these changes to the patient's health, whether it's the medication, the treatment, et cetera, you don't know exactly what's gonna help in what way. So we take the time to, to, to learn. But um, going back to your original point, you know, the whole, the whole real estate market has, has changed over the past five years from what I've seen. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and as real estate agents finally catch up to the 21st century, uh, it's been interesting to see how they've reacted because traditionally real estate was an offline business. You know what I mean? It's, it's handshakes, it's meetings, it's mailers, and that's where they were. The dinosaur, the, the websites were all dinosaurs. They were ugly, they were bulky. And part of that is because the market and the industry was very restricted. Um, the primary thing was your IDX feed, right? Your mm -hmm. IDX feed uh, through real comp was, was handcuffed. They didn't want anybody to have access to it. And if they did have access to it, you had to be a top level programmer to be able to take that data and then build a custom website. Otherwise you would have to go through your broker, right? Who had these cheap template looking websites that were very old and generic. Uh, and many of the real estate agents uh, did that. They just went through those and they didn't really invest in their digital marketing. But over the past couple of years, you slowly start to see these people be like, wait a minute, what am I doing? I'm behind the game. Because at the time, I would say back, back for whatever, and I've heard this many times, the idea was so-and-so is the top dog in the field and they have an old website, they have old marketing, they have offline marketing but they're killing it. So why should I do any different? It was sort of this follow the leader mentality. Whereas now we're starting to see many of these independent agents coming out and saying, no, I don't care what they have. I need to be different. And they're building their own website. They're creating Facebook pages and Instagram pages, and they're going out there and they're building their brand persona around what they post. And that's why you see now, especially on Facebook, so many real estate agents created these business only pages where they go on and they put their listings in there and they've built this following on it. They sort of got the taste of success from digital marketing, all without really investing any other money other than their own time. No, you're absolutely right. <clears throat> Just four years ago, when I was reaching out to website builders to try and get them to have a website that could link up with the IDX feed and have some sort of, you know, 
optional login, you know, not even a forced registration is, is the words we would normally use, but you know, maybe something where, um, as, as a lot of people see, obviously when they post a listing and it's on, even on Facebook, it's like, click this link and you click the link and to actually see all the information, you normally have to enter some information and, you know, there's obviously some lead generation purposes to that. But the thing that I think is tough to explain to the average consumer is that the thing about that link is it's live. So let's say I have your house for sale and it's at X price today. We came on the market and mm -hmm. 25 days goes by and we don't sell it. Um, not even an interested person. We've had a few showings. It's been really stale, which we know is not the market right now. So one thing could be price. So we adjust the price. Well, that link will update, right? If somebody comes back to the link or if I re-advertise the same link. So yes, it required a registration, but it required a registration because the Facebook side of things, it doesn't always, it, I can't update a Facebook post mm -hmm. um, if I advertised it. I can change a Facebook post. Once you do the advertising, you can't change that, you know, that whole post like that later and repost it basically yeah. so if i say you know four bedroom 2800 square foot house in this city and all this stuff i can reboost that out and with the same link and the link has all the updated information so mm -hmm. there are some benefits whether that's a registration or not there are some benefits to clicking on that link that don't just benefit the real estate agent who's posting it um and unfortunately you know there are obviously agents that after they get that registration if they get you know, real information, they just, you know, really hammer that phone until the person uh, signs a contract, basically. I mean, I've heard agents in, in coaching groups, I mean, like professional coaching groups that'll say, um, you call them until they sign or they die, you know, and it's like, excuse me? <laughs> I mean, but, and, and, and kind of to your point, they're always the agent that's killing it, right? They've done, they do 150 transactions a year. They do all these millions of sales. And I'm like, how, when you annoy the hell out of everybody that you call. But, um, but you know, I couldn't get someone to have like those types of things, right? A registration and an IDX feed and a nice site that had different pages, like a blog page plus listings, plus marketing materials that integrates with YouTube. And finally, I was able to find that, you know, through searching and searching. And over the years, I've changed a couple of companies and I'm really, you know, happy with who I'm with now, but it's not cheap. And, um, you know, but it, it does all those things. And, um, and so you're right. It, it took a while for the industry to really catch up. And there's still a lot of people that don't believe in websites or even Facebook pages. You know, they still believe in like an Excel spreadsheet or Outlook for their CRM. And they believe in, you know, they're just going to make business happen. Well, I mean, that's so, so, so to your point, um, it's, it's a, there is a large expense to it. I mean, your average, your average, you know, agent coming out the gate who, who doesn't really have a brokerage it isn't going to have the funds to really be able to devote to a large scale digital marketing campaign. You know, um, these flyers, um, on on the on the the front end of it are a little bit cheaper, you know what I mean? Because it's it's kind of like this fixed cost. I know it's going to be this amount, and hopefully I'm going to get a sale or two or three out of this batch of flyers that I sent out. But when you get into the digital marketing world, a large focus of your marketing isn't direct sales. I mean, I, I mean, it's kind of this this fallback term that marketers use, but it's brand building. You're building this community and whether you get the sale immediately or whether you get it a year from now based on the work that you're doing today it's easy to to gauge but at the same time it takes time it takes patience and it takes funding um and with many people who don't know the digital world they fall into this trap of not knowing who to trust there are some marketing services by big name big brand uh, companies that are out there that tell this large, large kind of package deals for brokers and for, for agents. But at the end of the day, when you look at the nitty gritty and you look at the details, say like, I can look at it and be like, well, they're not really doing anything for you. But for your average agent to come into the game and pay a money or sign up for a fee and not really know what they're getting, it's very difficult. So 
it's kind of like this stage we're at right now where many, many agents are sort of breaking eggs, getting into the market and trying out different things to see what works for them. But it is difficult. I mean, I will say from a digital marketing standpoint, it is difficult for many agents, partly on, uh, on the net because of anti-discrimination laws. Mm-hmm. For example, if you are doing boosting and if you are... Do- so when we're talking about Facebook real quick, let's differentiate between boosts and advertisements. So you on the front end would do a boost. You sort of throw $20, $30 on it. That's a boost. There's really no direct demographic targeting. It's kind of like, here's 30 bucks. Give me some people to see this post. What we do as an agency are advertisements. So we work through the business manager and we set up campaigns that have multi-variables that we set and configure and design to get your achieved result. On the advertising side of it, it's very restricted for a real estate agent. For example, one of the main things is um, geo-targeting. Um, Facebook restricts geo-targeting to 15 miles around any point that you're advertising. So for example, if you're advertising in Northville, Michigan, um, because you want, say, higher higher priced houses or higher priced shoppers, you have to do 15 miles around there, which would end up in lower income areas. Mm-hmm. So for some real estate agents, not that anybody's discriminating because obviously anybody can move from wherever to wherever, um, this is going to ultimately cost them more money because they end up with people who are not in their ideal demographic range seeing their ads, clicking on their ads, and spending their, their ad budget. So there's a lot to consider when running for, like advertising campaigns. And what is your th- thought as to why Facebook got hammered with this, but Google or Alphabet, whatever they go by when it comes to their ads now, they did not. Because I can still run a Google ad and say 48167 or 48160, or I can say Northville. Or I can say Farmington Hills, you know, but like you said, on Facebook and ultimately, uh, no, Instagram's not really that way, is it? Um, no. But on Facebook, you know, I can't, and I understand where it came from, from Facebook. I get it, you know, because basically, you know, the uh, HUD, you know, came after them, you mm-hmm. know, and said, like, you guys are violating all these anti-discriminatory, discriminatory, ah, anti-discrimination rules <laughs> and things like that. Uh, but why why not Google? I mean, what's geez, they're the go-to when it comes to online advertising. How are they not discriminating but Facebook is? Yeah, so that's that's a, it's a very good question. And 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 to be blunt, I don't know an exact answer. I could tell you what I think. Um, I don't know the exact answer, so don't quote me on this. But Facebook for the most part, so so partly partly to say to, to respond to something you said. Instagram is part of Facebook. So Instagram Instagram ads goes through the Facebook ad network. So they are subject to the same rules. Um, again, if you do a boost uh, through the front end uh, or through your business profile in Instagram, uh, you don't really have those. But if you do a professional advertising campaign through the business manager on Facebook, it would apply to um, Instagram, Facebook, and its ad network. So in browser settings and mobile applications. Um, so that applies, but Facebook, Facebook is the, the, the enemy that people love to hate. Um, even though they're on it, even though they're using it, it is the enemy and, and who knows the reality behind it. I mean, there, there's conspiracy theories that are out there that it's a tool of the CIA, um, <laughs> it's a spy on us. I don't know. Maybe it is. I, I don't really have any knowledge one way or the other, but um, because because it is so large and, and information gets spread so easily on its platform, and they did a very poor job of of ensuring privacy laws. Uh, I will say that Google does a much better job at privacy than Facebook does, sure. and because Facebook was embarrassed so many times because of these privacy lapses, I would assume that that's why they are so stringent upon it right now. Well, and I don't know if they fixed this problem, but I know initially, you know, we're in Michigan. So, of course, we're just next to Canada. And if I was a Detroit realtor marketing downtown Detroit properties, now I would be advertising into Windsor. And I'm not saying nobody's ever bought, you know, a house 
or, or a condo or something out of Windsor into Detroit. But the, clearly that's not who my market was really meant to be. It was meant to go to somewhere else. Or let's use New Jersey, you know, the state who is yeah. bordered to New York. You don't even have a license in New York. You have a license in New Jersey and your ad has to go into these other states. This happens all the time. Maryland, Virginia, D.C., you know, you don't have a license in all three areas all the time. You might have it in one or two, but yet the 15 mile rule caused a big problem. And I don't think that it's fixed, but it hasn't really affected me that much to spend time figuring out whether or not it is fixed, you know? So it's a weird, it's kind of a weird rule, but without, we don't even have to focus on like the real estate aspect of things in general is, is Facebook still cheaper than say Google or some other options because that's always been the saying, right? It is like, go to Facebook, it's cheaper. It's cheaper, it's cheaper. Mm-hmm. You know, Google's too expensive now. Pay-per-click is too expensive. Is that the case? Do you find, you know, that to be the case? Depends Depends on, on which strategy you take on. So so like, like Google AdWords, uh, there are different targeting strategies that can affect the price of your per click. Um, Facebook also has uh, three main strategies um, as far as how you acquire your 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 ad buy. So they have brand awareness, lead gen, and then sales. So depending on which funnel you're going into, because ideally the the Facebook model has this strategy where you take everybody from one level to the next, and then finally close that sale on there. Step one, two, three. And they do this through their pixel. You help track who's interacting with your, your, your ads. If you're on the front end of it, if you're on the brand awareness campaign, um, it's very cheap. Um, and then as you pro- progress uh, towards, towards your, your second and third level, the cost per click goes up. Uh, or your cost, the cost per interaction, excuse me. Uh, because it's not necessarily a click, right? Brand awareness is if somebody sees your ad but doesn't interact with it or click on anything, you're still getting charged for it. Um, and then and then they fluctuate a lot. I think Google, because it's been around for a lot longer, it is more stable in how its advertisement is set up. Whereas Facebook, I mean, as far as I've seen, is still fluctuating in their pricing. Um, for the longest time, video ads were more expensive than image ads. Now I was just speaking with a Facebook rep and they're promoting video and motion graphics saying that it is more cost effective. Uh, and, and they even went as far to tell me as it was cheaper. I don't know if I believe that hundred um, percent, but it, it, they're still fluctuating. I, I don't know hundred percent if we can even trust Google's advertising platform a hundred percent just yet. Google or Facebook? I'm sorry, Facebook. Okay. You cannot trust Facebook's uh, advertising platform 100% just yet. Um, they did have some some scandal at this point. I think it was a year and a half ago where they were overpricing and, and charging for ads and inflating their numbers of interactions without it being reality. They promised that they had fixed it, but at the end of the day, who really knows? Sure. And I think that's an issue and maybe something we just have to unfortunately accept in some ways where i mean even if whether it's pay-per-click it's impressions it's uh views it's you know anything like that i mean how do i really know unless you send me that person's data that i can call and say hey did you click on my ad because i didn't hear from you you know like there's no real way uh and especially when it comes to impressions i mean what's an impression if i have my phone and i'm going like this down the thing is that an impression or is you know when i'm looking at it and i actually stop and i'm looking right at it is that an impression you know like those things i know that there are definitions to it and i know you could a- actually answer the question but who's to say like you said and i'm not trying to get all conspiratorial that you know they're out here lying to us but is the metrics all perfect maybe it's not thumbing through but is it if you're kind of scrolling like this and i have a chance to see it you know things like that so these are things that have to be factored in, I'm sure, as we think about our budgets and understanding that some of the money is going to be, quote, wasted, right? Like, quote, unquote, Absolutely. wasted. You know, um, it's just a part of doing business, I guess. Absolutely. Well, I mean, and that's, that's where the, the more trust in Google comes into place. Because with Google, for, for a certain um, 
element of it, the, the, you can verify their numbers because if you have Google Analytics set up, for example, or a third-party analytics service, whatever it be, um, and then you have your Google ad, ad platform running, you know, if they say that you had a thousand clicks, you can, to a certain level, verify that with your Google Analytics, okay? Now, there's a trick, though, because Google's a little bit sneaky. Because if you look at your ad platform, they monitor your clicks. If you go then to your analytics, they monitor users. So it's not a one-to-one -one ratio. So you have to take into account because a user can theoretically click on the same ad multiple times, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. They gauge a user as a certain number of visits in a particular amount of time, but it's not a direct number of visitors, one-to-one uh, -one ratio with the ad. So, but there is a level of accountability. If I had a thousand clicks and I had 600 new users, for example, in one particular month, I can reasonably assume that the advertisements did that. And then you can check where they came from. And then you can set up also specific links on there. Whereas with, uh, with your Facebook platform, again, if you're going into those levels, on the first level, where, which is a brand awareness campaign, you have virtually no way. There's no way that you can verify any of those numbers. When you get into the, the lead gen um, and the traffic um, portions of it, and then the sales portions, then you can create customary, custom links where you can track exactly who's coming from the advertisement to your website. And that's where you use the coding, uh, the ad tracking through Google Analytics onto your website. What we like to do whenever we're doing an ad campaign or multiple ad campaigns is we will set up various landing pages for every single ad campaign to make sure that we know who's coming from where, what lead is generating what, and then it helps to track it. But on that front end of that, yeah, Facebook really, there's no way to verify those numbers. So <clears throat> these are obviously the two big ones. And Instagram is kind of becoming and kind of coming in there, I feel like, you know, as maybe third. Are they third? I mean, if, if we said Google Ads and Facebook are your top two, you know, advertising platforms, who's third? Who comes in like in, and how close is third? Yeah. So, so, so Instagram again is still through Facebook. So sure. they don't count, they don't count Instagram separately. Um, I have to double, you know, actually, and I just did a report on this and I had to double check the numbers, but when you're looking at, when you're looking at the ad platforms, so you have Google, which is the largest, then you have Facebook, um, coming in next, then you have, uh, the, the auxiliary. So, I mean, you would think something like LinkedIn. LinkedIn is actually a very small platform. They're, they're slowly building. But when you look at Facebook is a monster, uh, LinkedIn only has like 25 million users, which sure. is very small in the social media world. Uh, at this point, I would say uh, Facebook, uh, Facebook, Google, and um, LinkedIn. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Twitter. Twitter, I would look at as a, as a marketing platform. But there, there's a big caveat here, and I, and I want to make this clear. Just because something's big doesn't mean it's relevant to your business. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Identifying who your target uh, audience is, is is very important. Because, for example, being in Yahoo have advertising platforms, okay? And they are a lot smaller than Google or Facebook. However, if you are dealing with a primarily older uh, audience, uh, they are much more likely to go to Bing or Yahoo than they are to Google, primarily because that is what is stock on their device. For example, if you get a Windows device, what is your default browser? Internet Explorer. Somebody like you and I, who are tech savvy, will automatically download Chrome or Firefox and leave Internet Explorer. Whereas somebody who's less tech savvy will stay with Internet and use Bing.com as their search engine. They won't know any better. So if you wanted to target older communities, then I wouldn't go to Facebook, um, depending on the age range, obviously. Sure. You can go to Bing and still make uh, a good amount of money or a good amount of impressions uh, on their app platform than anything else. Same thing if you're going for a younger audience, that's where you can go through the Facebook ad platform 
but target specifically Instagram and Tumblr rather than Facebook itself. So Facebook does give you the ability to target which of their components, because they have, I believe, about seven different components that you can target through their ad platform that you don't even need to be on Facebook at all. And did Snap just like completely fall off the face of the earth? Because I feel like they did, other than for users, but from an advertising, I mean, when they went public, I was, you know, on I'm on Snapchat or, you know, I use it, but like, I don't use it half as much as I use anything else. And I use it way differently. Yeah. Um, you won't see many pictures of my family on there or whatever, you know, like it's really like car karaoke or something like that. You know what I mean? Like, uh, and so, um, so, but I felt like kind of like I was the guy who had never clicked on a Google ad. I thought, well, maybe I'm not the right, I'm not the target demographic, you know, in my late thirties for snap either. So maybe that's the deal. But when they went public, I was just like, who's, who's going to pay to advertise on there if we feel that they are for a younger generation. And I think we're hearing that now with TikTok too. You know, you have a lot of people that say, Oh, get on TikTok now because it's the next big thing. And my whole take is, well, they can't buy a house, you know, they can't, they can't legally buy any product. Um, so why would I spend a lot of money advertising? Maybe I want to have a little familiarity with what it is or how, it, how it interfaces, but to invest even five dollars doesn't make sense to me. Um, have you? Have you? Do you run any businesses uh, through any of those platforms like that? No. Uh, short answer is no. Um, their 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 advertising platforms are so so limited, and for the longest time, so so Snap Snap similar to Nextdoor, for example, they 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 produced and they built their platforms off of only allowing really these top level advertising to, advertisers to be on there because they didn't want to saturate their platforms with ads, right? So they, they had this VIP status for many of their advertisers. So a lot of the small people with smaller budgets didn't even get a seat at the table. They didn't care about us, you know? Um, so I wouldn't ever recommend advertising on those platforms. Now, with TikTok and with Snap, it's very important, it's very important to use it more in an organic sense. So as a real estate agent, for example, I have seen many real estate agents uh, go on there and build their brand persona. So a lot of this goes back to the branding, right? Sure. Now, when we have marketing, when you, so, so let me back up a second. When you have marketing, there is organic growth and inorganic growth. Organic growth is more of the social media maintenance, website development, search engine optimization, which is what we do. And then you have the inorganic growth, which is any type of paid advertising service. Because uh, if you think about it in the gym, you have the people that go to the gym, work out in the gym. That's an organic growth. They slowly build muscle over time. Um, inorganic growth is the person that day one, they shoot up uh, steroids and they're going to get the fast results. I mean, no judgments, but they're going to shoot up. They're going to shoot up steroids. They're going to get fast results. But when they stop with the steroids, the results typically go away, right? Yep. Uh, so on those social media platforms like Snap and TikTok, it's important to gain organic growth. But a lot of it has to do with your marketing strategy. See, the, the problem with real estate agents specifically, let's talk about that, um, is they were way too late to the game. You know, there is this bell curve of users on a social media platform. And early on, you have your early adapters, okay, who take on these social media platforms like TikTok or Facebook early on back in the day. And then they build these large scale pages that have on Facebook, tens of thousands of followers. And on TikTok, you can get hundreds of thousands of followers relatively easy. And then the longer you wait until more people realize that this site is going to be popular, then it becomes so much more harder because what happens? The, the company itself, Early on makes it very easy because they want to attract everybody. But then all of a sudden, when they realize that people are coming there, they switch their gears to advertisers and then they limit the natural organic awareness of people to a much slower rate. So now if you have a Facebook page, for example, it's much harder to gain a thousand followers than it was five years ago. You know, so 
the earlier you are on a platform, the better it is. So looking at TikTok specifically, is TikTok going to be popular in five years? Is it still going to be around? If it is, is it worth it for a business to get on there and build a large following really quickly on TikTok and then coast through to when it becomes much more difficult to build that following and make money off that organically? Or are they going to assume that it's not going to really go anywhere? And then in five years, when it is bigger, then get on there and be like, well, it's a little bit too late to build that following now because then yeah. you got to pay a lot more money. That makes sense. And <clears throat> probably the only person I've ever heard say that, you know, like everybody, everybody always looks at just the advertising side of things. I feel like uh, at least maybe because obviously someone's probably pitching it to me or maybe I've seeked it out. Right. I've, I've asked somebody else to help with something. And so, um, and again, even in like a coaching platform that I was a part of, um, I guess they didn't say you had to advertise, but they definitely were saying, you know, get on it. But the focus was really like to, you know, be able to advertise. <laughs> and so, but that, that makes probably the most sense because I even think of myself with Facebook. I mean, unfortunately I wasn't in this industry when I first started really posting on Facebook, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I try to keep my friends numbers limited. I try to, you know, it's very different than now where if you ask me to be your friend, all I do is look and make sure you're like a real person. You know, you're not like some like fake person or from some foreign country, nothing against foreign countries, but I don't know if you're going to hack me. So, you know, I won't add you, but otherwise I'm like, all right, sure. Add. And, um, just to try and grow the, 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 the list to grow the people that you might, you know, reach out to or, you know, hear from you and stuff like that. So, um, so that makes sense as far as like what you just said. And, uh, I would just, you know, say like wise words, <laughs> wise words yeah. for sure. Um, so, so here we are now. And again, in my industry, um, there's always those people that are going to spend and advertise and market. And then there's people that maybe didn't. And I feel like, you know, March came around and suddenly there was whispers of uh, whether or not we'd be able to conduct business. And then sure enough, you know, we were shut down for a little while from the ability to do in-person, you know, meetings and anything that required us to leave the house. And a lot of people, it seemed like, said, well, I'm not going to do any kind of advertising. So one, is that your take on real estate agents? Because I know that you work with some. And two, you know, what about business as a whole? You kind of said it real early because I asked it real early. But let's get into that a little bit more if you don't mind. You know, like what are people, what were people doing and what are people doing now that were starting to reopen businesses and try to reestablish some sort of normalcy? Well, so you have three three types of uh, clients that we've worked with. Um, and and when I say types, I mean, in regards to this, you have the, the businesses that were still doing well, um, that, that didn't shut down, um, you know, your services industries, your medical industries, um, and people who felt that they can benefit off this for lack of a better word, not in a bad way, but I mean, they were still doing business. Sure. So we had quite a bit, we had, we had actually new people who never advertised before come and they were specifically in the food industry. Uh, who came and they're like, we want to send out advertisements. We want people to know that we're open. And they, they wanted to push that they were still doing deliveries. You had the, the second tier, which is we have to go back. everything. We were shut down. We're not doing any business. If I get a lead right now, it's not going to make any difference um, until we open up again. Because they have a brick and mortar store. Sure. So they, they completely paused their services. And then you have the third type where it was, we want to do it, but I don't even know if we're going to be in business in a month from now. So it's not even worth spending any more money. I don't have it to spend. Um, so people fall into those three categories. Um, I will say on, on our behalf, and I'm very fortunate, uh, although we did lose business, um, you know, overall, uh, when we look at the net, uh, the net gains and losses over last year, we are definitely down from last year. Um, but we weren't devastated. We did have a good mix of people who's dropped off and, and new people who came on board. 
Um, but overall, what we saw is many businesses tightened up their, their purses. They, they became much more conservative in how they spent ad dollars, especially uh, many of these major corporations. We did an article on Coca-Cola cutting all of their advertisement um, because they were losing major dollars in their commercial market. Um, and, and it makes sense. When you have all of these in-dining uh, places uh, shut down and they're doing delivery only, all of these auxiliary uh, services like Coca-Cola and all of the drinks and so on are going to suffer because of that. Um, so I think, I think you do have this mix. In, in, in specific to real estate agents, um, I believe that their organic services were still strong. Um, people were posting more. They were, they were still uh, promoting themselves in different ways. Um, because keep in mind is that like in any sales industry, you're not necessarily going to be selling your product 100% uh, percent of the time. You're going to be selling yourself. Mm -hmm. So real estate agents were still posting. They were building communities. Um, and, and you found this, you found this really uh, in politics. And I want to be very careful how I say this. Many people benefited from the situation. Uh, because of the words that they used, whether you were for or against the quarantine, you sure. saw some individuals who really became very popular because of their views against the quarantine. And you saw some people become very popular for their views towards the quarantine. So organically, I think it was really successful for several people who played the game correctly. Mm -hmm. um, in an advertising sense, advertising overall did go down. And that makes sense. Obviously, I, I can just tell from my own experience, you know, I like to do all the things from just telling people what's going on, be educational and informative, as well as advertise if there's some new listings or a recent close. But sometimes when you're doing those like listings and closings, you know, it's a little bit braggadocious, right? It's, mm -hmm. uh, hey, I sold this house. Um, whatever happened, I sold it with more than one offer, or I sold it faster than average or in one day or whatever happened, happened. Even sometimes, sometimes you just say, man, it was really tough, but I still got it done, you know, mm -hmm. and you, you have ways of saying it, but anybody who can, you know, read slightly between the lines understands what you're saying. You're saying another one done by me. And so it got and is difficult right now because I feel like there are people that see this advertisement that probably could care less how good I am at real estate or how well I did selling a house because they're not even sure if they can make their next mortgage payment or they're not sure if they're going to have a house to live in or they're just lost a family member or something like that. And so it gets really tricky because you don't want to abandon what you do, but at the same time, you don't want to always be overly positive with how good business is, so to speak, um, when people are hurting, right? So it's really tough to find like a happy medium right now, at least for me and some people that I talk to, you know, in, in my business. Absolutely. Um, it's tough. It's not, it's not easy. Well, I mean, here's the thing, and 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 um, I'm gonna I'm gonna regurgitate kind of uh, a, uh, a tad bit of knowledge that I gained um, going to a convention not that long ago, um, and and you know I forget the the gentleman's name, um, but very smart, very smart person, um, but he basically told me that people really care about one thing, uh, and that's consistency, okay, and that goes into branding, right? So if you are braggadocious, if you're a bragger, okay, if you're cocky, if you're arrogant, if you're, if you're this very loud, boisterous personality, you will attract a community that appreciates that as long as you are consistently uh, braggadocious, you know what I mean? I mean, look at President Trump, for example. I'm not going to judge him good or bad on, on how he is, but he does have this confidence to him that mm -hmm. allows him to say whatever he wants to say. And for some, it offends them. And for other people, 
it, 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 tur- it, uh, it attracts them to him. But he's been very consistent with his message. Now, you look at other people, uh, like you or me, for example, who really aren't out there like that. I mean, we're, we're kind of the same. We're not out there bragging like, oh, man, I made X amount of dollars this year um, because it's not in our nature. If you are consistent with your message in good times or bad times, um, I think that, that people will be attracted to your personality, uh, to your brand personality, whether it's individually or your company, and, and they will appreciate that and you'll have that following. But I do want to say, I do want to say um, that it is important to keep in mind that ultimately we're going to survive this, right? I mean, God forbid we, we, we get the disease and, and, and we, we are affected uh, terminally by it, but we're going to survive. You know, I mean, most of us will at least, and we have to focus on what's going to happen after it's all over. And, and three months from now, six months from now, at some point, things are going to go back to where, not necessarily where it was, but to a new level of normalcy. And we have to focus on bringing our business to that level and not worrying about, um, are, are, are people going to be offended by that per se, or are people going to get bothered by that? Because right now for real estate agents, you, I mean, you guys are open, right? You guys are, you guys are permitted to show houses. You guys are, so you really need to be hitting the pavement and, and advertising and whether or not somebody is financially in ruins or affected by that, obviously it's very devastating to the community, but at the same time, you need to not let yourself be devastated. You need to pay for your family and provide for your family. And that's why you, you shouldn't really be afraid to offend by selling through your channel, because ultimately that's what we all need to do. We need to get out there and do business for ourselves. And and that makes sense, <clears throat> excuse me. And, and I kind of personally, you know, I came to that realization, um, you know, I, I gave it a couple of weeks and said, okay, uh, I'm still going to provide education and I'm still going to do the other things, but the um, here's what's available now type of posts and stuff like that, I kind of held off. But even before we were officially, you know, allowed to show houses, you know, I got back to, hey, afraid to go into a house or can't go into a house right now, here's 10 houses with virtual tours that you could buy right now. Um, you know, here's a house that uh, we're closing on right now, you know, that type of thing. So uh, it was temporary, but I think that there's probably people still going through that struggle. And I think what you said makes a lot of sense because if you stay true to who you are, then anyone who was going to utilize your service, whether they knew you or didn't know you, are still going to because they understand this is who you are. And you probably run into that potential um, if you don't stay true to who you are, that people might think that you were fake in the first place, I guess, you know, depending on <laughs> depending on how much advertising and how much talking you did, right? If you only posted once a month to Facebook, then it probably doesn't matter. But if you posted five times a day and now you post once a month, people are going to wonder what happened to you, you know? So yeah. let alone advertising. You know, so uh, I definitely think staying true to who you are is really important. So, uh, again, um, wise words of wisdom coming tonight from uh, (laughs) from from yourself, sir. So I get it right once in a while, you know. (laughs) So where do you think we're going as far as like the business side of things? Um, Obviously, there's no real way to predict, you know, the real future. But just based on what you've seen and what you hear, whatever news outlets you follow, you know, do you feel like your business will pick back up to where it was? Do you think it'll get busier because as businesses come on board, there's going to be a bigger need for advertising? You know, like, how do you see kind of like the short term and just long term future for for your business or just business in general? Yeah, so... To go along with what you said, who knows? I mean, really, we don't, we can't predict what's going to happen three months, six months from now. Um, one thing that I've personally uh, learned or, or become aware of is business isn't as stable as it was in the 1900s. You know what I mean? Businesses throughout the 1900s, you would hear of uh, professionals working there 35 years, 40 years, retiring you know, having a pension or a severance, and, and that was the life of it. And, and these days, business is much more chaotic. 
Um, people typically do not stay at the same job for longer than two or three years. There's a lot of people bouncing around and businesses are rearranging all the time. Um, being a smaller business, uh, speaking personally, we do have the freedom of being able to pivot easily if what we if we find that what we're doing is no longer necessary in the new market. Mm -hmm. Not saying that's the case. I'm sure we're always going to be necessary. But if the new market um, changes where um, we're not filling a need and we're not as important as we were back in March, then we can easily pivot into something new. What I what, what would that be at this? this point i have no idea because i don't plan on it i'm confident i i mean i am confident that two months from now businesses will slowly be going back and and it's not so much it'll it'll be back to normal but it'll be the new normal which everybody keeps saying and and the importance of that term is something that people will become accustomed to you know, at some point, people will be accustomed to a new way of life, whether that will be similar to March or completely different. Once we become accustomed to this new way of living, then new life can begin. And that's where businesses will grow. Keep in mind is that if we look at business like a forest, you have many trees, some strong oaks, some seedlings. Once that fire comes through there, it'll burn off what it burns off. That doesn't mean that life dies. That only means it'll provide a new opportunity for life to grow. So for my company, although we typically are strongest with traditionally strong businesses, businesses that have been around a while and have larger advertising budgets, we are just as capable to work with new businesses and help them gain their footing. So if businesses did shut down because of this whole mess, ultimately new businesses will thrive. It's inevitable. It's the circle of business life. And if they do come into place, we will be ready to service them. I'll tell you, like your answers, um, you have like uh, a great understanding of what you what you do, what you represent, you know, what, what's going on. And personally, I really appreciate it because, um, you know, when I, when I talk to anybody, one of the things I love about what I do is I get to talk to a lot of people. And one of the things I love about doing this, you know, brokers and brews is I'm talking to even more people and people that I haven't, you know, met or talked to or talked to in a while or what have you. And, um, you know, like, I think we've had, I think I've had like three, you know, moments during this conversation where I've said like, wow, yeah, that's, that sounds about right. You know? So, um, all I could say is, um, there's like four, cause we changed, you changed the room. So there's four beautiful people behind you. And, uh, if, if you're as good and knowledgeable with, uh, being a father and husband as you have been during this, uh, conversation, then, uh, you've got, you know, some people that are very fortunate to have you around. Um, I could stay on here and talk forever. I don't know if you want to get going because uh, I even saw like your post today about a difference of eight years and it looks like you've, you know, done some body transformations and we could talk that, you know, and stuff too. <laughs> so it's your call, but if not, I mean, we could totally end on a high note there. Cause I think what you said about business, the circle, the evolution of business circle of life of business, you know, things like that is 100% spot on, man. Um, a great take and and there's i have nothing i could possibly add to that <laughs> <laughs> well listen you are you are definitely too kind um you know i i think i think being a parent or being a person you alluded to to my body transformations i, I think the the greatest starting point is identifying that there's room for growth and in my life specifically i am far from perfect and i always am looking for new ways and i will say i am fortunate for the whole the whole shutdown it allowed me to to have some some new perspectives on different things in my life and allow me to grow in different ways, which I'm still continuing to. There is no end to growth, but I I, I think I think at this point, let's leave it at this. And if we want to do another one, I'm always down to do another talk. I mean, I think it's fun uh, having these discussions that we can get into those personal aspects. But 
Uh, I really appreciate the time of being with you. I mean, I think, I think, you know, we agree on, on many points um, because I believe that you are very open-minded uh, to new ideas, new thoughts. And, and based on what I've seen you post, uh, I think that you are a great person as well. I mean, I see the picture of your family. I mean, you got two boys there, if, if I can see that correctly. Yep. Um, and, uh, and they are, they look to be actually about the age of my children. I got, my twins are eight years old, about to be nine. And my young one is about five years old. Um, so I think as fathers, we both realize that both in business and in personal, you know, it is no perfect job. We're always going to have slip ups, but we have to keep improving in both aspects to become ultimately, uh, what we need to be because ultimately there is no definition on what we should be. Right. We just need to be what we need to be at a particular time and place. So, uh, I appreciate the opportunity of being on here and speaking with you, man. Yeah, no, I appreciate you doing it. And for sure, uh, sometime in the future, we'll, we'll have some more conversation and hopefully we'll be talking about how much better business has even gotten, right? So uh, I don't know if you have anything left at the bottom. I've got a little bit for like a going away cheers, but would love to say, hey, cheers. Thanks very much. And yeah, uh, we'll talk soon. For sure. Looking forward to it. Thank you.